speaker and Marcus Hacker. Um, as Marcus makes his way to the podium, he's the head of nuclear medicine at the Medical University of Vienna. Um, they're an extremely large institution which have uh, access to PET MRI and not one but two total body PETs. Um, and today he's going to talk to about us about his experience with 68 gallium. I'm sure we're going to be very interested to hear how FAPI is going to change the PET CT world. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Uh, thanks Sabine and the organizing team to have me here. It's a great honor and pleasure uh, to speak here at your uh, annual conference in the UK. Um, it's a particular pleasure to speak about uh, FAPI. I think uh, this is a new diagnostic compound uh, which uh, will help us to enter a new era. Um, we get, get into, into music now. <laughs> We're getting more and more interested uh, besides cancer cells, atherosclerosis, um, neuropsychiatry, in uh, the extracellular matrix, how we call it, or in the tumor stroma. And I think fibroblasts are um, linking inflammation to cancer and to other diseases. Uh, and I want to guide you in the next uh, around 45 minutes through this exciting new topic. Um, I will not only concentrate on um, gallium-68 FAPI, but will also show some uh, potential diagnostic approaches and also other FAPI compounds like with uh, F18. So this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I will start with some basics because I think fibrosis is a pathophysiological process nuclear medicine physicians are not so much into. Um, and then I will go through um, potential oncological and non-oncological indications. And at the end I will show a few new concepts in how to use FAP compounds for also therapy. But let me start with um, the, the concept of fibrosis and fibroblast activation. So, uh, very generally spoken, um, there are um, perturbations, injuries, like acute injuries, but also chronic inflammation, autoimmune disease or genetic disorders, that have the ability to um, activate, obviously, the immune system via chemokines, cytokines, change the extracellular matrix, and uh, the body, the human body, the, our organism uh, is able to reduce or remove uh, that stimuli um, and uh, that leads uh, to a regression um, of these alterations. If the um, yeah, inflammatory uh, stimulation continues, then uh, this process of fibroblast activation is initiated and this, this can lead to fibrosis in different major organs and um, this kind of fibrosis diagnosis is not so much or was historically not so much um, a domain of nuclear medicine. Um, there is techniques like MRI or um, elastography um, where we can uh, diagnose um, fibrosis uh, better, uh, but now I think with the new compounds we are able to contribute in that field. And you know, uh, fibrosis is of course something that uh, is hard to treat and it terminates diseases of liver, kidney, lung, heart, just to name uh, the most obvious organs. Um, fibrosis is also um, related to tumor growth, and I will show you. Uh, some examples uh, on that afterwards. Uh, what is important to understand if you speak about um, uh, fibroblast activating proteins is that the central uh, cells uh, involved in that process are so-called myofibroblasts. Um, these, kind of, um, yeah, these are kind of structural cells which are uh, omnipresent in the whole body uh, and which can transform into uh, activated cell types. What we image if we use FAP compounds is only the activated cell types and this is the reason why we have a very low uh, background signal. I will show you examples on that. 
the function of the myofibroblast, if they get activated through the immune system uh, or other stimuli, is uh, immunomodulation. So fibroblasts are able to remove inflammatory processes, uh, but also to strengthen these processes. And the, uh, the target here is mostly macro macrophages and lymphocytes. Uh, fibroblasts are also um, engaged in ang angiogenetic processes, and uh, this is most obvious, of course, also in, in scar formation and uh, fibrosis generation. Um, in the tumor setting, fibroblasts can um, um, uh, stimulate tumor growth, tumor progression, metastasis generation, uh, and it contributes also to, uh, to the transformation of cell types, stem cells, uh, um, um, epithelial cells into mesenchymal cells and uh, cancer cells. So a very central uh, uh, class of cells we are targeting. Uh, and how we are we targeting? So if you look at the surface of fibroblasts, there are uh, there can be receptors and proteins activated by this uh, inflammatory stimuli. Uh, one of these uh, is uh, the integrin receptor with, uh, with with its different subtypes. Um, most of you uh, are aware of that probably because uh, there have been already uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, already pharmaceuticals for PET invented. Uh, particularly for alpha V beta 3 integrins, but there are also other traces. Um, there are also the PDF, uh, PDGF receptor expressed in stellar cells. Uh, what we want to talk about today is this uh, little uh, protein, a transmembrane protein with a large extracellular domain, and this is exactly the target. Uh, um, which we uh, which we aim for uh, by the use of um, of FAPI PET or uh, uh, therapeutic uh, FAPI compounds. You can use antibodies, peptides. There are inhibitors, uh, also cold drugs available, uh, targeting exactly this protein, which is only uh, expressed on the surface in the case of uh, activation of these uh, type of cells, fibroblasts. Uh, this is an overview of um, uh, radiopharmaceuticals that are uh, um, available. And you see here, uh, all in all, and this is a review of 2000, um, uh, 2022, I really can recommend a very nice overview. Uh, at that time, 294 studies were published uh, on the topic of FAPI PET imaging. Uh, and you see that most of the compounds, and these are the upper uh, five, six compounds, um, are, uh, de were developed in Heidelberg by Uwe Haberkorn's group. Um, and there is now also um, square acid uh, platforms available, developed in Mainz by Frank Rush. And there are also um, um, uh, compounds available um, of um, 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 developed uh, by industry, um, the FAP2286 um, is a Clovis compound which was recently sold to Novartis uh, and uh, this is a phylogene compound and, and now we have also some uh, fluorinated <laughs> tracers available, so though there's a broad uh, portfolio of tracers in principle available we can use. Um, the NOS means not otherwise specified, so there are multiple studies out that did not, not specify which compound uh, was used, but uh, most probably uh, it was one of these uh, uh, most famous compounds. And the most used compounds is the FAPI-04 compound, uh, which was, as I said before, developed in Heidelberg and then licensed to Sophie Biosciences uh, in Los Angeles. What about the biodistribution and why is this, um, this compound so interesting for nuclear medicine? Um, so what you can appreciate in comparing with FTG PET uh, is that um, there is of course lower background in the brain, uh, so the brain is empty if you wish, uh, but particularly also in the liver and in, in here in this um, pharyngeal, pharyngeal mucosa area, 
uh, we have uh, nearly no background. Uh, and also other organs like uh, the colon, uh, bone marrow spleen, uh, but also the heart, which is always it's an issue in FTG imaging, uh, do not show um, um, really uh, massive uptake in FAPIPEP. So the contrast is very high um, if it comes to detection of, uh, for example, cancer lesions, but also uh, the detection of um, uh, local processes in certain organs. Um, the only what they have in common, both tracers, is the excretion uh, via the kidneys into the bladder. Um, this is um, uh, true for both tracers, FTG and, and uh, FAPI PET tracers. So a very interesting uh, new compound uh, which we can use for visualizing and quantifying activated fibroblasts. And this is what we are doing. So coming to oncological ind indications, um, we have to understand that what we are imaging is not the cancer cell. So we are imaging, again, activated fibroblasts. Uh, and um, so the topic here is the tumor stroma. Uh, and uh, as I said before, we have um, uh, many uh, of uh, structural fibroblasts in, in the tumor stroma. Um, and um, uh, there are cancers where the stroma contributes um, up to 90% of the whole tumor volume, so stroma is really important, consisting not only of course of fibroblasts, but mainly of uh, immune cells, of an immune uh, infiltrate, uh, but of course also lymphatic and, and uh, other blood vessels. Um, so once the fibroblasts get activated, uh, they have the ability to promote, as I said before, tumor growth, um, you know, cell invasion, angiogenesis. Uh, and this is a central function of fibroblasts in tumors. And this is the reason why they are, uh, uh, the reason why they are activated and the reason why we can image uh, the, the cancer. So we are Im not imaging the cells, but the tumor microenvironment. Uh, this is how the receptor looks like, and um, if we now think through it, uh, think through the cancer progression uh, as such, uh, then, uh, as I said before, it starts with a stimuli. So we have these fibroblasts in the tumor stroma uh, uh, at any time, and uh, these fibroblasts get activated by the tumor cells via chemokines, cytokines, enzymes. Uh, and in the next step, these activated uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts, as they are called now, uh, they are releasing uh, proteases, uh, matrix metalloproteases and others, uh, which destroy the basement membrane uh, of the cancer so that the cancer can grow invasively into the stroma. The cancer itself, again, releases growth factors which uh, modulates uh, the tumor stroma in terms of inflammation and uh, fibroblast activation again. Uh, so uh, then we have the stage of really massively activated fibroblasts uh, which um, uh, secrete uh, um, paracrine uh, um, uh, compounds and which directly interact with inflammatory cells in the tumor stroma. So a lot of functions of these fibroblasts, and this is exactly what we're imaging, the activated fibroblasts. Uh, this is again this overview from 2022, and you see here that in oncology there have been around 200 publications released. Uh, uh, now, uh, half a year later, I would expect uh, nearly 300, so there's an exponential growth. Uh, I uh, cannot cover every indication today, but I will go through the most important indications. And these are particularly, if you look at the cohort studies, there are many case reports published, of course, uh, in the initial uh, use of, uh, with the initial use of the FAPI compounds. But now there are also cohort studies out, um, gastrointestinal cancer and uh, the uh, hepatopancreatic biliary cancer types. 
uh, but there are also um, uh, publications out in the head and neck area because of the low uh, pharyngeal mucosa uptake. Um, urological publications, esophageal cancer. So there are really uh, many studies out on different cancer types and we can, we can learn lots of these still relatively small uh, studies, but uh, um, uh, we have more and more uh, patients now included and can already draw some conclusions out of that. Uh, this is one of the first studies published by Clemens Kratoch mm -hmm. from Heidelberg in 2019 already. Uh, and what he did, he, he just looked at different kinds of uh, cancers. We heard in the previous session already about the CUP syndrome, uh, cancer, cancer of unknown primary. Uh, but there are lots of cancers uh, which really express the uh, fibroblast activating protein on the surface of that we can image. And you see here the red line is the blood pool. So we have really significant uptakes of, of uh, a broad range of cancers. And what's really impressing, if you look at these images, is that we have really no, no background signal. So every nuclear medicine physician uh, who sees uh, these kind of images uh, can, can be made happy because of the low uh, uh, background and the high contrast of the, of the cancer uh, sites. Um, so, as I said before, um, normally we don't have uh, a significant liver uptake of the tracer, uh, but if it comes to hepatocellular uh, lesions and cancers, uh, then we frequently, of course, have uh, liver cirrhosis, which is a fibro uh, fibrotic process. Uh, where the uh, fibroblasts are also activated. This is the reason why in that example, here we have uh, really a liver background uptake. Uh, and we have a long uh, lasting uh, cooperation with the Peking Union Hospital, where we set up some studies in the gastrointestinal field. And one of that study looked at suspicious uh, hepatic lesions. And you see here one example of a T1, T2 positive tumor, also the, the DBI was positive, And both uh, FTG and um, FAPIPET were negative. And uh, there was an incidental finding here in the thyroid, a focal uptake of the FAPI, uh, which uh, appeared to be um, a papillary thyroid carcinoma, which was necessarily negative uh, as, as a good differentiated tumor in the FTG. So we have um, tumor uptakes which are not there in FTG, and there is discrepancy be between both. And I will show you some examples later. So what we did in that study, we compared FTG and FAPI-PET in the um, uh, detection and the rating of um, or the classification of liver lesions. Uh, and what you see here is that FTG was really 200% uh, true positive, but the true negative rate was only 30%. So there have been malign tumors that were, were rated as negative or not, uh, which did not lead to an FTG uptake. Um, and in FAPI, we found that really every lesion could be uh, rated uh, rightly, so uh, negative and positive uh, lesions. If you look at the per lesion study, we had uh, 23 lesions. Um, and um, the problem for, or the challenge for FTG, as we all know, is hepatocellular carcinoma, where the uh, true positive rate was really only uh, 43%. And I show you some examples. So the FAPI pet was again uh, really good with 100% detection rates. Uh, and this is a typical case of a, a hepatocellular carcinoma, where you see this uh, this rim of uptake uh, around the necrotic part of the cancer, uh, and you see here. Uh, no FTG uptake uh, in that carcinoma. Cholangiocarcinoma, a similar pattern, but positive also in the FTG pet. Also, the lymph node metastases were positive in both FAPI and FTG pet. So there is uh, a strength of, F of FAPI pet, particularly in this gastrointestinal uh, tumors. Uh, and um, uh, this is the reason why we looked a little bit deeper into um, into the correlation of the FAPI uptake with the histology. 
uh, in patients that get surgery. And you see here a typical uptake again of an hepatic carcinoma, uh, which was proven in the H and E staining. Uh, and you see also in the FAP staining that the FAP was massively upregulated um, in this um, in this <coughs> immunohistologic uh, slices. Um, if you quantify the lesions, and this is a trend that I showed before, um, the, the purely differentiated lesion showed more FAPI uptake than the well differentiated lesion. Uh, this was the hypothesis from before, because like a vicious cycle, the, the FAP protein is more and more expressed, the fibroblasts get more and more activated, the more um, invasive the uh, the cancer grows and the more uh, de-differentiated the cancer is. Um, and we looked at the same uh, in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Um, and you see here well differentiated, moderately and purely differentiated. Again, the Ag staining and the FAP expression. And you see that with increasing FAP expression and with increasing de-differentiation, the FAP uptake uh, gets higher, and you can quantify this. So this is immunohistochemistry and the FAP uptake, and there is a nice correlation between the FAP uptake and uh, the proportion of FAP positive cells. And the area under under the curve reaches uh, 0.90 for differentiating between purely and well differentiated, well and moderately differentiated um, pancreatic uh, adenocarcinoma. So we can use this not only for uh, cancer detection, uh, but also for cancer classification, potentially. Uh, so this is a summary, a nice uh, review again, or meta-analysis published this year on digestive system tumors, including pancreatic and liver cancer, but also including esophageal, gastric, rectal carcinoma, and smart, uh, small and large intestine. 18 studies were analyzed for that meta-analysis, and you see that the sensitivity with 0.98 over all studies is extremely high. Uh, on, a, on a patient level, uh, and particularly the primary tumor detection is extremely high and uh, characterization with regards to the FAP expression. Uh, in metastases, obviously, there are some issues depending on the, um, on the uh, tissue of origin, the metastasis uh, appears. Uh, you know about this clonal evolution and the different uh, um, 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 growth and uh, uh, biological transformation of the tumor. So there are metastases who are not so affin to uh, fat expression than others are. Uh, but in the primary tumor, it seems to work uh, really quite nicely. Still, uh, in the mean, there is a sensitivity of 0.94 for uh, metastasis detection with FAP in this type of cancers. What about lung cancer? There's also a recent study out um, showing that uh, there are differences between the different subtypes of lung, lung cancer. Here we have a squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, small cell lung carcinoma, and you see that the the FAP uptake is very different. Small cell, uh, squamous cell carcinoma has the highest FAP expression uh, in the stroma, uh, while SCLCs have the lowest. And this was also proven by uh, immunohistochemistry staining. So there are differences uh, um, with the different uh, uh, cancer subtypes in FAP expression. And this is how it looks like. Um, so again, um, uh, squamous cell carcinoma with the highest uptakes uh, through all these different types of metastases, um, while um, SCLC have a relatively low uptake. This is a cancer where FTG works quite nicely, so we do not necessarily have to replace FTG here, of course. Um, then I want to show you thyroid cancer. There is also a word because I come on that uh, I'm back on that later uh, with regards to their gnostic approaches. Um, so what this group did, and this was a, a study published in radiology last year, uh, they looked at metastatic thyroid cancer, uh, hormone sensitive and hormone refractory mixed, uh, uh, and they compared FTG and FAPIPET, um, and um, what they found is that FAPIPET was superior or equal in most of the 
um, in most of the uh, patients, uh, and there were only some, uh, let's say, lymph nodes uh, which were better detected uh, with FDG. So there could be another indication, um, and particularly in reflection of um, the potential diagnostic approaches um, I will show you later. Um, this is examples, and what you see is that uh, in metastatic thyroid cancer, the FAP expression is nearly always higher than the uh, FTG expression, uh, and you have examples like here, patient number 17, where um, um, uh, lesions were detected that were not, not detected in FTG. So also potential advantages of FAP over uh, FTG alone. Uh, so now I come to, from my point of view, an even more interesting topic, and this is uh, non-malignant diseases, uh, because uh, as I showed you before, fibrotic diseases is a major challenge for medicine, and there are more and more treatments available, anti-inflammatory, but also anti-fibrotic treatments, and the hope is that we can, by the use of FAP compounds, um, 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 stratify patients and those who benefit from anti-inflammatory versus uh, anti-fibrotic uh, uh, treatment. And I will show you some examples on that. So this is again back to the review of Van der Hoven, uh, which I cited before. Um, and he listed here 122 um, studies in that context. Uh, again, uh, 21 cohort studies, mainly done in the cardiovascular setting, but there are also uh, musculoskeletal, um, head and neck, and, and other uh, mixed um, um, benign indications. And I will go uh, a little bit through it. So one is uh, infarcted myocardium. This is obvious because, you know, after myocardial infarction, uh, people developing a scar tissue, which uh, uh, decreases the uh, left ventricular function and leads to heart failure. So this is, of course, of, of very high interest to detect stages and to, to uh, characterize the tissue with regards to potential therapeutic targets. Uh, and um, we have to reflect, first of all, uh, what are the phases after myocardial infarctions, so after occlusion of a coronary artery. There is a local necrosis. Um, if uh, the patient cannot, um, uh, rever uh, cannot be revascularized in time, and this uh, necrosis leads to the release of so-called DAMS, damage-associated molecular patterns, which is mainly uh, recruiting, uh, recruitment of, um, of inflammatory cells. Uh, that migrate into the myocardium, uh, and these cells again stimulate the fibroblasts. The fibroblasts are transformed and are particularly active in the proliferation phase, which is around three days to 14 days uh, after myocardial infarction. Uh, and if the problem cannot be resolved in that time, then it comes to really fibrosis and scar formation, uh, which is not the ideal endpoint, as I said before, because of the decline of the left ventricular function. There are nice studies out in the um, in the preclinical setting, this is a study from uh, Wolfgang Weber's group uh, in Munich, uh, and what they showed is that there is indeed around day six, seven, there is the highest FAPI uptake, so this is within this uh, proliferation phase. Uh, here's a comparison with FTG, so the inflammation goes down uh, early uh, after day three, uh, and it comes to this um, FAP activation in the formation of the uh, of the extracellular matrix uh, with the generation of fibrosis and scar tissue. We also looked at that at later time points. Lix Young was doing that uh, two weeks and six weeks, and you see that in the, within this proliferation phase, there is still a lot of fibroblast activation which declines uh, until uh, week six. So uh, the TBR values in the myocardial infarction area are um, significantly higher as compared to sham operated animals. Another interesting uh, indication is um, cardiac amyloidosis. So most of you are interested in uh, ATTR, so transturtin amyloidosis, because we can uh, uh, image uh, these with um, uh, bone spec, or bone scans, let's say. Uh, 
a challenge for diagnostic always is the, the uh, light chain cardiac amyloidosis because patients come too late and uh, they have already heart failures and it's very difficult to treat these patients. They have a very, very uh, bad prognosis. So, of course, we try to reach this patient earlier and uh, fibroblast activation is a stage that uh, still can be treated. Uh, and what you see here is that with, with increasing myostages, uh, the, the myostage in, in uh, light chain amyloidosis is, is uh, consisting of mainly CKMB uh, values uh, and troponin values. And you see that with increasing myostage, the FAB uptake is increasing. So the FAB uptake shows us really uh, the progression of the disease and we can use potentially this signal uh, at, at a very early stage. Of course, there are also other uh, PET tracers like amyloid tracers under investigation, uh, but um, the, uh, the, the FAP has an advantage, which, which I show in the next slide. Just to continue with that here, uh, so FAP uptake uh, is nicely correlated to um, uh, pro-BMP uptake, uh, extracellular volume uh, measured by MRI and uh, the left ventricular and systolic volumes, so all parameters for uh, the left ventricular heart function. Um, and this is the reason why the FAP uptake could be important if you think about uh, targeted therapy concepts. This is a preclinical study that was published uh, 2019 in Nature. And what they did is they worked with the uh, with artificial fibrosis model. You see here in red, uh, they initiated fibrosis uh, through toxic uh, drugs they, they injected in, into the uh, animals. Um, and then they used uh, FAP-directed CAR T-cells to treat the fibrosis. So these modified T-cells, CAR T-cells, um, are uh, targeting uh, the FAP expression in the myocardium. And this is the reason why the FAP expression, which we can diagnose in vivo uh, in the living body, uh, could be of major interest in the future. This is, of course, not only true for heart uh, diseases, but also for potential other diseases like uh, uh, FAP-directed CAR T-cell treatment in uh, different oncological diseases. So this is what we should have in mind, that FAP is not only uh, detecting tumors, but also characterizing tumors and can visualize and quantify the, the FAP expression and in stroma. Um, there is, of course, also, this is a study we did, again, together with the uh, uh, colleagues of, of the Pichin Union Hospital. This is FAP activation atherosclerosis. Again, FAP 04 was used here. And you see that, uh, indeed, we can uh, image uh, um, in the large arteries, uh, the FAP expression, uh, and uh, we have to understand exactly what this is. You know, with progressing atherosclerosis, it comes to uh, stiffness of the arteries, fibro uh, fi fibrosis processes in the arterial walls and classification, and the fibroblast ac activation might be an early stage for this uh, initiating this, these processes. And you see here that it, it's inversely correlated with both Hounsfield units and degree of classification. This is a very similar pattern we know from FDG, for example. If you look at inflammation, uh, the more classification you have, the less inflammation you have. So this is in line with what we know from, from, from FDG studies, for example. So could be a potential new target for, um, for um, um, and, uh, uh, detecting early stages of uh, fibrosing, uh, fibrosing um, atherosclerosis in the large arteries. What about autoimmune diseases? Uh, this is an example of Crohn's disease, and we did a, a, a prospective study here, which was published recently in, in radiology, um, with a, a new compound, data squaric acid FAPI, again labeled with uh, gallium-68. And the reason why we use this compound is was the hope that we can use it for their gnostic approaches. This is a, a, a ready pharmaceutical optimized for treatment, and this is also the reason why you see here such a high background. So this compound can hardly be used for uh, organs like liver or heart, um, but it can be used nicely for uh, the abdomen. 
And um, what's important in Crohn's disease is to differentiate really between um, uh, inflammatory stages and uh, fibrotic stages leading to the strictures you see here, uh, contrast gadolinium accumulation and a stricture of the of this part of the uh, of the bowel here uh, of the uh, intestine. Um, and you see this is a PET MRI study, and you see that the um, the accumulation of the trace again uh, uh, relates to the FAP expression in the immunohistochemistry. Uh, and what was interesting to see is that the uh, FAP uptake uh, in the bowel really, or in the lesions in the bowel, really correlated with the fibrosis grading of uh, immunohistochemistry. Uh, and um, it was striking to see that um, really uh, the fibrosis is the driving force here and not the inflammation. So if you add, if you have segments with both uh, fibrosis and inflammation as compared to inflammation alone, uh, there is really the shift of the SUV of the uptake. So what you can image with fibroblast is definitely different of, of what you can image with FDG. So uh, fibrosis, activation of fibro fibrotic processes versus inflammation. Uh, there are rheumatic diseases that are of very high interest from my point of view. Uh, IgG4 related disease in this case. Um, again, FAPI and FTG was used. This was a uh, very nice work by the Erlangen group in Germany. Um, and we know from immunohistochemistry chemistry that um, we have, um, with increasing fibrotic scores in the tissue, the inflammatory scores are declining. Uh, so again, there is an inverse relation between both uh, pathophysiological processes. And what these uh, rheumatologists were interested in, uh, this disease can affect nearly every organ in the body. And uh, there are really strong uh, drugs available for treatment, anti-inflammatory and uh, anti-fibrotic drugs. Uh, and they were really interested in how FAP or the fibroblast activation can help to stratify patients for the one or the other treatment. And this was the first study published on, on the topic. Uh, and you see here again, you have a, prof a proliferative uh, phenotype, uh, an inflammatory phenotype where FTG is positive and FAP negative, and you have fibrotic phenotypes where FAP is positive and FTG is negative. There are also, of course, mixed phenotypes, but uh, this is exactly what the clinicians want to have because they can base their treatment decision on the patterns of the, uh, on the phenotype of the disease. Uh, and um, you see here that the FTG and FAP was nearly not correlated, uh, which always means that there is obviously incremental values for using uh, the one uh, with, uh, together with the other. Um, and then what they also did is anti-inflammatory treatment. And if you look at the response to treatment, the FTG nearly goes down to zero. So it's an anti-inflammatory treatment. Inflammatory cells is a surrogate for FTG uptake, and this goes down. The FAP uptake does not go completely down. So there is all, still, uh, despite the anti-inflammatory treatment, there is still uh, fibroblast activity, uh, which you see here. So after FTG uh, is nearly inactive, and FAP to 50% is still active. Uh, so clinicians have to decide then to add an antifibrotic treatment, new experimental treatments to that, um, because these kind of diseases really end up frequently in uh, yeah, joint failures and uh, fibro uh, fibrosis in nearly every joint we have in, in, in organs. Um, the same group looked a little bit later then on systemic sclerosis associated interstitial lung disease. Uh, and what uh, you see here is the fibrotic areas in the, uh, in the lung, in the dorsal part of both lungs. And you see that these areas really accumulate FAP while the other areas do not. Uh, this is um, true for different SUV values and different quantification strategies applied. Uh, and um, this was very interesting to see because then they, uh, they tried to treat uh, the patients with uh, a multi-kinase inhibitor, an nintetanib, 
uh, and you see a very mixed responses. So there is a patient uh, which has a, a basal uptake of FAPI, uh, but the uptake increased with the treatment. And here's another patient with a basal uptake where the uptake declined. So we cannot really still predict which patient responds to which medication. But I'm sure this is a very strong group from Erlangen will uh, set up prospective studies with um, uh, prospective intervention studies to find out how FAP uh, and FAP imaging uh, can help in these regards. Uh, I will not talk about uh, treating this kind of diseases, which would be my, my favorite treatment. Uh, so using lutetium FAP compounds, for example, to treat this fibroblast activity, because there is no published experience on that. Uh, but I will later speak on other kinds of uh, treatments, which we call, of course, diagnostics link uh, PET imaging with potential treatment. Uh, so there are also some studies out, um, 11 studies um, with different compounds. Of course, mainly the uh, Heidelberg compounds, uh, FAPI 46 is a, a modified compound um, uh, optimized for treatment. Um, and we have some studies on also dotoscaric acid compound. Um, to summarize all these studies, uh, the, the contact time and the effects on the tumor because of the st uh, stroma binding sites uh, was, is still relatively low and the, the doses we can achieve uh, at the tumor are still relatively limited. Um, and this is the reason why there was not yet a breakthrough made. Um, but uh, there is also light in the, at the end of the tunnel because now uh, the, the chemist started to develop uh, this kind of um, um, drugs, dimers, and the hope is that with a dimer, if one uh, binding site is released, the other binds, and that you can, can prolong the binding of the uh, treatment compound to the, to the fibroblasts. Um, and uh, there are also uh, even studies out, with, which I will show you later. This is one of the first studies. This is a very active Indian group who has access to, a, to this very acid platform of uh, Frank Rush in Mainz. Um, and um, what they did is, first of all, uh, they, they, um, this is end-stage breast cancer with no other treatment options. Uh, they, they knew from the FTG scan there is multiple um, um, proliferative metastasis. Then they did a, a DOTA uh, FAPI scan and uh, saw more or less the same metastasis and then decided for an experimental treatment with lutetium DOTA FAP and you see the accumulation in the, in the uh, breast tumor but also in the, in the bone sites um, and in the, in, in the, in the lungs. Um, and um, yeah, this is how it all started. Uh, and then the same group set up uh, a prospective trial um, with um, radioiodine refractory uh, thyroid cancer uh, that uh, have even got uh, thyroxine kinase inhibitors before. So also a very late stage where no other treatment options exist. Um, what they did then is, uh, after inclusion of the patient, they did a, a baseline DOTA, squaric acid, FAPI, together with FTG, with, uh, when both were positive, uh, they, uh, they gave two to three cycles of uh, lutetium DOTAGA compound. And this is, DOTAGA is this new dimer developed, um, which we are also very interested in. I will show you some, some data on that later. Um, and um, then they did an uh, interim PET, uh, and if positive and if progressive, they did uh, other cycles of this uh, new FAPI compound. And uh, this is an example. This is a patient, uh, radioiodine refractory after TKI with a high uh, tumor globulin uh, and multiple metastases. Uh, they treated. Uh, post-treatment scan uh, after 168 hours. So the binding of this compound, of this dimer, to the tumor stroma is, is very long and very high. And they achieved really extremely good response. And the tumor marker uh, went back to 6,000. And you see the, uh, from the images the very nice results between baseline and, and follow-up. 
And this is, of course, stimulating, and people work on that. Uh, you see here, uh, they, they didn't make a complete response, which is in that stage probably not possible. Uh, but in most of the patients, they really achieved a partial response. Uh, I mean, this is, of course, a, a very nice response, but uh, uh, biochemical response um, and, and all that. And only one patient in that setting, in that very late stage setting, had, had progressive disease. So this is really um, could be a very nice uh, indication for future diagnostic approaches. Um, just to, to show you, this is one of, one of the first patients we did in, in Vienna with this Dotaga compound. Um, just to show you, this is uh, scans up to one week after treatment, and the critical organ definitely is in that FAPI Dotaga treatment is the colon. So we are really experienced in kidney, we experience the salivary glands and other organs, but not in the colon. So we have to learn now there are strategy we know from iodine treatment, for example temporary iodine uh, to mobilize the colon and the intestine and to, 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 uh, to force the excretion uh, of the radiopharmaceutical through the colon. Uh, but we will see how far we come. The critical dose is around, I think, in, in the colon around uh, 30 or 28 um, uh, millisieverts. So we, we have to figure out how many cycles we can give. We have to do uh, really uh, detailed dosimetry in these patients. But uh, yeah, we are all in the learning phase. But I think uh, this could be one future option. At least um, what, we, what we have in mind, and this is the topic from before, is to really start treating also rheumatic disease. Our rheumatologists are extremely interested in that because they have clinical settings where they uh, really lose the patients. They, they, uh, so due to anti-inflammatory, antifibrotic treatment, they cannot achieve really um, significant success. So to sum up this lecture, um, uh, we learned that activated fibroblasts uh, are mediators of, of inflammatory reactions and ex uh, extracellular matrix generation and degeneration. Um, the FAP protein is expressed on activated uh, fibroblasts only, uh, and it's an important molecular target for drug interventions as well as, well as uh, PET diagnostics and, as I showed, uh, radionuclide treatment. Um, I think I could show that FAPI-PET has diagnostic advantages as compared to FDG uh, because of the fact that, of course, the molecular target is different from FDG and we target a completely different uh, patho pathophysiological uh, process. Uh, in several cancers, uh, there were, uh, these FAP expression is associated with tumor aggressiveness, invasiveness, so that there is hope that according to the FAP expression we can also characterize uh, the tumors in this regard. Um, the great hope from, my, from me personally on non-oncological diseases, um, because I think we can uh, um, we can um, quantify and visualize these uh, activated fibrotic processes uh, which lead to the endpoint of the um, stiffness of the joints and, and all that and organ um, uh, failures. Uh, and I think the radionuclide therapy is getting more and more promising with the dimers and new compounds developed. And I think there is a new, also, um, diagnostic approach available for both oncological and non-oncological diseases. With that, um, I'm through my topic, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your attention. Comprehensive and, and a wonderful talk. Um, do we have any questions from the audience, first of all? Yes. I'd like to come to the mic. Thank you. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed that talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not a clinician, so this is incredibly naive, I'm sure. But can you comment on your view on lutetium's treatment of the non fibroblastic components of the tumour? Um, do you think that those path lengths um, in the tumours that you've seen are hitting those non fibroblastic components? Um, and do you see potential for lutetium FAPI used in combination with other therapies? to target not just the fibroblastic component, but other components as well. 
So thank you for this question. You're starting, of course, with the most difficult question. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you're, you're completely right. I mean, the uh, so one target of this treatment is, of course, the cancer cell, obviously. Uh, but what we are treating with is, of course, also all the, let's say, inflammatory cells around the tumor and the tumor stroma. And uh, to be honest, I cannot really predict how this changes the immunity of the tumors, for example. Uh, we talked before about uh, immune checkpoints and the affection of uh, stress on immune checkpoints. Uh, what we know from radiation generally is that we change the immunity, we change the uh, the, the uh, cell exhaustion in the uh, tumor stroma, uh, and we change completely the signaling in that regard. But I cannot really predict. Um, I, my my thought would be that we, uh, with this uh, radiation we are applying, we destroy the inflammatory cells uh, at most. Um, and but what this changes in the, in the immunity and signaling, I cannot I cannot tell you. But the major aim is, of course, first to destroy the, the cancer cells, and this is the reason why we uh, have to, to go up with the, with the doses we reach at the tumor site. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, not surprisingly that the two concepts are different. Um, the FDG is probably more specific than the FAB1 because it, it utilizes the glucose uh, thing. And now, in my experience, that uh, the FAB1 lags behind clinical response to FDG. And I've seen cases where the FAB1 actually is much lower uptake than the FDG, and this gives the wrong signal to, to oncologists that the patient is responding. And you know, th this is a very important point that they might actually be very comfortable with their oncology, I mean, with their chemotherapy, that they say that the FAB1 is responding, but that's not actually the actual uh, reason. I've seen patients who actually deteriorate on FDG rather than FAB1. So we should not give that, uh, mis 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 uh, giving the wrong signal to, to oncologists. Thank you. Thank you, very important uh, comment. Any other questions? Or I've, got, I've got a question. Uh, when will FAPI be uh, reimbursed in Europe? <laughs> uh, this is a, a difficult. So I think in, as a, there are countries in Europe that uh, are relatively quick with reimbursement. Um, Austria, for example, we can use nearly everything we want because we have a fixed budget and we can do whatever we want. Other countries like Germany, uh, they are relatively quick with um, reimbursement of treatment but not of PET. And countries like Italy, for example, they have, as far as I know, flats for PET as such, um, so that they can cover um, also other radiopharmaceuticals than FTG. Um, so it, it's strongly depending, I think, on the health system, the reimbursement system, in the, in the, in the lo so the local system in the, in the countries. So can you use this now clinically in Austria? Are you able to? Yes. Yeah, so we are using this uh, routinely. Uh, and um, our partners also, uh, I didn't cover pulmonology and there, there, are, there are different so hepatology. Uh, all these organs I showed before that generate fibrosis in, in certain uh, disease entities, they are extremely interested in, in that compound. Um, we will see how far we come here because, you know, the, the signal is uh, continuously increasing. Uh, and uh, we have to learn what we can, uh, for what we can use this information. I mean, for therapy monitoring, um, I think we can use it, but for a, a heart diagnosis, so is there uh, fibrosis, yes, no, uh, it's difficult because of this continuous process. Uh, there are perhaps other modalities like MRI or so that are more useful in that regard, but we have to learn how to use it. Thank you. Um, yes, Phil. Do you think the sensitivity for detection of uh, fibroblast activation is sufficient to be able to use it as uh, an early biomarker of toxicity, off-target toxicity in cancer treatments like cardiotoxicity, for example? 
I, I would say, I mean, this is also a good question. So we, uh, because this is really an emerging field, so cardiac toxicity or a toxicity for other organs. I think in many organs, the FTG uh, works quite well, but for, let's say, prediction of, of let's say, uh, fibrotic processes, it could be very useful, I agree. But I'm not aware of um, studies that looked into that already. There might be, but I'm not aware of that. Oh no, you're right. There are there are studies from Essen uh, looking at that, and they um, there are three four studies out uh, where they used FAPI for um, um, uh, toxicology prediction in the heart muscle, uh, so myocardial toxicity, uh, and it, it has worked out quite nicely. I cannot remember if it's it should be better than FTG because FTG has always the problem in the heart muscle to with the suppressed uh, metabolism there. Good idea. Simon's got a question. Thank you for a, a, a timely and I think a, 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 a really good talk because I think uh, I've spent 20 years in lectures like this listening to the next tracer that's going to transform oncology and imaging and I think FAPI is the first one that feels like a real winner to me and uh, of, uh, it would be interesting. I think it's going the future utility will be in the tumor types in which FDG currently fails, and what do you, what's your feeling about that? So definitely uh, gastrointestinal tumors um, are um, a focus of ours and of others, uh, because uh, we know that hepatocellular carcinoma, particularly if they are well differentiated, they, they do not take up um, the tracer. Um, there are, so in the, in the cancer setting, this is mostly what we are doing. I don't think that um, there is a significant improvement in lung cancer, for example. Uh, prostate, anyway, not because we have PSMA, neuroendocrine, no. Um, could be colon cancer, particularly if it comes to, to liver metastases again. And the, uh, the head and neck cancer, uh, the, the diagnosis should be also improved. Uh, I'm not sure how it works with uh, renal cell cancer, where we are also limited with FTG, um, but there are cancer types where I'm sure that um, um, uh, FAPI will make it in the future. Thank you for excellent talk. I'm asking a question slightly from cardiology point of view. So, you know, cardiac MRI looks at the fibrosis, fibrosis process, and, you know, it's the best way of looking at myocardial infarction now. How does it compare with FAPI? So do you think you can see that earlier with FAPI because structure and function, um, you know, structure changes later, function changes first? <laughs> yeah. So that's one thing. Second question is about perfusion. You know, often when we do FDG imaging, um, you cannot tell of a patient who has got ischemic heart disease, FDG gets taken up in those patients, uh, and so you cannot differentiate between ischemia and inflammation. Do you think FAPI would be a game changer here? Thank you. So, a very good question. First of all, I mean, uh, MRI, and uh, this is um, uh, always a good promotional strategy that they are imaging fibrosis, which in, in fact they are not doing. They are imaging the um, extracellular volume, if you wish, the leakage, uh, which is closely associated, of course, with fibrosis. But I think the, uh, the surrogate and the molecular target is completely different. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that we can add uh, to all these difficult diseases in, in the heart muscle uh, by the use of uh, FAP compounds. Uh, we have to learn the difference. Uh, what I showed before, our studies in the uh, light chain amyloidosis setting, uh, they are both were quite nicely related, I must say. I would I would assume that the earlier we uh, the, the earlier in the disease process we can we can provide the images, the more we find the differences between both. Um, and the second, yeah, of course, I mean, myocardial inflammation with FTG is complicated. We have to change metabolism, suppress um, glucose uptake. Uh, we have to prepare the patients properly. And this is always a challenge. So we would wish to have other compounds to do that. Um, 
We will have to learn uh, what's the difference between, let's say, the very early inflammatory stage and the, the little bit later uh, activation of the uh, fibroblasts. So if it's uh, early enough to intervene uh, based on the FAP decision, or if it's already too late, we have to learn. But uh, in the theory, in the, in the, the cascade of the pathophysiology processes, the FAP, uh, the, the FAP activation is later than the uh, inflammation. And this is um, always then the, the question what we are looking for and what, what, what treatment options we have. I'd just like to make a comment. Um, I think in terms of uh, reimbursement and cost effectiveness, I think patient selection for cancer is going to be important, especially multimodal therapy when you're combining it with checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy. I think Fabric would potentially um, help you select patients for a combination of immune checkpoint immunotherapy and targeted molecular radiotherapy, not only for selecting patients for, but for response assessment also. So that could be a good use case. Um, with that, I'd like to thank uh, you again. And as a token of our appreciation, Rich is going to present you a little certificate for giving our plenary lecture today. Oh.